मॉर्निंग अर्ली All right, yeah. Um, I'm assuming that the volume and all of that is fine for those of you who are online. Uh, we'll get started um, now. Uh, just to go back over all the classes that we did in the first half of this semester, we started off with the doctrine of the Word of God. Then we went on to look at uh, the doctrine of God Himself. We looked at Trinity. and then from after having talked about god we kind of came into the topic um, on humans so we looked at the doctrine of humanity and in connection with that we also looked at the doctrine of sin so um, now that we have finished talking about the doctrine of sin uh, we will be moving into the doctrine of christ um it's through christ that a uh, solution was offered for sin so we kind of change the order in which the you know um, lectures are being done so it is different from the um, you know order in which your notes are given so um, when you have your midterm assessment uh, these are the topics which be, which would be covered so even for those of you who are here in the class these would be the topics on which you would have to submit your assignment not the things which are there uh, in the order in your textbook so we did doctrine of sin last week this week we are doing the doctrine of christ okay okay someone has given the assurance that the audio is fine so yes we'll continue so um uh, what are we going to talk about in the doctrine of christ we will look at the divinity of christ we will look at the humanity of christ and we will see how both of these uh, two natures coexisted within him uh, so that's basically what we would be looking at today to start off with the divinity of jesus christ um like you know we had talked about earlier when we were covering the nature of god uh there were people who said uh that jesus never thought of himself as divine it was only much later that his disciples thought it would be a very very nice idea you know if if they go around saying you know what jesus is divine so they say it was only much later that the whole idea of divinity started and that jesus never really ever thought about himself as being divine and then we also you know disproved that wrong theory Uh, we pointed out that in the scriptures jesus in fact very very clearly talks about himself as god and we looked at a couple of scriptures which you know bring out that fact that he very much thought about himself as being divine um but today of course because we are covering the doctrine of christ we will look at these things in greater detail so we will begin uh, you know even as we are talking now about the deity of christ we'll start off um by looking at john chapter 8 verses 56 to 59 and we look at the significance of what happens in these uh, in these verses if someone could read out for us john chapter 8 verses 56 to 59 your father abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad then the jews said to him you are not yet 50 years of old 50 years old and have you seen abraham jesus said to them most assuredly i say to you before abraham was i am then they took up stones to throw at him but jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by yeah and uh, so jesus is having this conversation with a large group of jews and he says when abraham you know looked into the future and he saw my day my time he rejoiced over it and so they say ha ah, you're not even 50 years old because you know uh, jesus was just maybe 30 or in his very early 30s so uh, they say you're not even 50 years old and you're saying that you saw abraham rejoicing over you is it you know and so then jesus says very truly i tell you so whenever he uses that phrase very truly or verily verily or whatever it is you know it says in your translation um 
he is trying to say that what i am saying now is 101% truth and it is significant so pay attention to what i am saying and so he says very truly i tell you before abraham was i am he says and that and when he says that immediately the jews they pick up stones you know to stone him um why were they so upset with the with the words that jesus spoke uh, so to understand the significance of what jesus was saying over here in this passage uh, maybe we can look at exodus chapter 3 verse 14 where you have the origin of this phrase i am uh, exodus chapter 3 verse 14 and god said to moses i am who i am and he said thus you shall say to the children of israel i am has sent me to you all right so uh, these are the words that we find in the hebrew bible which was written in the hebrew language later on when they were translating the hebrew bible into the greek language you know what we know as the greek septuagint over there uh, the translation in greek the wording that was used for i am was ego i me you know ego is basically the word from which we have our ego you know who we are what we think about ourselves so uh, ego is me i and i me is am you know i am to be um, you know so that, so that in that sense um, the verb will be to me it to be and uh, the phrase will be i was i am i will be you know in that sense so ego i me was the greek a translation of the original hebrew where god says i am and so over here we have jesus using this same term ego i me and um if you just look at the word ego i me on its own as a sentence it's something that people would probably use even in ordinary everyday speech uh, for instance i would say you know um i would i don't know how to say in greek i am a teacher but then you know i would probably say something like ego i am a teacher you know i am a teacher uh, um so it was used in everyday sentences also this phrase um but uh when jesus used this phrase the way he said it was not in a in the, in the sense of an ordinary sentence construction and the jews were able to clearly pick up on that you know to use one example if we were to look at john chapter 9 verses 8 to 9 uh this is basically the passage where you have the blind man who washes his eyes at the pool of siloam and he is healed so this is uh this is that particular passage so if someone could read out for us john chapter 9 verses 8 to 9 yes so over here you know if you were to literally uh, you know read out what the greek new testament is saying here he it says but the beggar you know this the, this man uh, who used to be blind he uh, so others said some people said uh, that he is the same beggar other people said no he only looks like him but he himself insisted ego i me that's the word that he used i am he said no i am i am that beggar i am that person but nobody thought that he is talking about himself as divine or as being god it was just part of normal sentence construction so he was saying i am i am that beggar that you are uh, you know that that you people are talking about uh, but when jesus used this phrase he was using it in the sense of exodus chapter 3 verse 14 where god himself refers to himself as ego i me look at the way uh, you know jesus uses this phrasing he says before abraham was i am so um that word which is used over there for uh, was you know that's it that's another word to be there are two words for to be you have the word um the root word genomai which talks about something which is being because it came into being it came into existence that greek word genomai is talking about something which is 
which is being because it came into existence it had a beginning so over here jesus is saying before abraham genomai okay the actual verb is um, in genestai but in the, in the actual sentence but the root word is genomai which means something which came into being something which came into existence so abraham had a beginning he was a human being he was born one day and from that time onwards he started to exist so jesus says before this abraham before he genomai before he came into existence i am which means you know uh, the word i me it does not indicate any beginning it's just something which exists so uh, very directly he is indicating that i am not someone who had an origin and was born the way abraham was born i am i always have been i always will be so he's making a very clear declaration that he is divine and so he's uh, you know um, the significance comes out when we look at the contrast between abraham coming into existence and jesus who never came into existence he always was he always was there and so he says before abraham was i am and they clearly pick up on the contrast that he is presenting and they are very offended and they pick up stones to stone him so while critics may say that jesus uh, that jesus never thought about himself as god the scriptures that we look at in the bible clearly prove that jesus always thought of himself as divine it's not a story which the disciples made up later on in the future okay so um so in the same way in exodus 3:14 yahweh announced himself as i am here jesus is also announcing himself as i am both of them are saying that they are eternal that they always were it's not that they came to be one on one fine day rather eternally they have always been is what they are saying um and a few chapters after this in the book of john itself we see the jews again picking up stones to kill him and again it's because jesus makes a declaration that he is divine so the next passage which we would look at is john chapter 10 verses 29 to 31 john 10 29 to 31 if someone could read out please you know the people online also will have bibles they can always open their bibles and read so it's uh, you know it's not like that without bibles and someone has to provide from here i mean just to avoid the distraction too much okay so um yeah um so in john chapter 10 verse 30 jesus very clearly says i and the father are one and it says again his jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him so here earlier he used literally used that phrase ego i me and here he is saying i and the father are one these scriptures show very very clearly that um jesus is clearly declaring that he is divine maybe we can just look at one more scripture uh, john chapter 17 verse 5 if someone could read out john 17:5 so here jesus says the glory i had with you with the father before the world began so he talks about how uh, he already had divine glory with the father even before creation he's not talking about the future and saying oh, i'm hoping that one day i also will have divine glory the way you do he's not saying that he's talking about how he already had divine glory in the past and he is saying in the future i'll get it back you know when uh, when i have finished serving my purpose over here as a human being so all along jesus clearly indicated that he is divine and um, 
we will look at matthew chapter 9 verses 2 to 7 um now of course this is a story that we are very familiar with uh, but then you know if we could have someone read out matthew chapter 9 verses 2 to 7 Be a good child. Your sins are forgiven. Verses three to seven. And at, and at once, some of the scribes said within themselves, "This man does demons." But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, "Why do you think even in your hearts? For which is easier to say that your sins are forgiven you, or to say that Christ is God?" But then you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive us sins. Then he said to the paralytic, "Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house." And he arose. He arose and departed to his house. Okay, a lot of phrases over here which are very very significant. um so it all you know the, st- the story starts off with the paralyzed man being brought over there for healing and then uh, jesus uh, looks at the faith of the friends who brought him and he says take heart son your sons uh, your sins your sins are forgiven now when uh, jesus says that who are the people who respond you know with anger it is the scribes Uh, you know the, in 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 niv it says the teachers of the law they are the ones who say to themselves this man is speaking blasphemy how on earth can he forgive sins only god can forgive sins and then jesus says to them whom is he talking to he's talking to people who are teachers of the law these are people who know the scriptures inside out they probably even have memorized the entire old testament by heart so they know exactly what he is saying so jesus says to these teachers of the law he says which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk uh, but i want you to know okay he jesus says i want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins so um when jesus used that phrase son of man these teachers of the law would have understood what he is trying to indicate because daniel prophesied about the son of man and we see that in daniel chapter 7 verses 13 to 14 if someone could read out daniel chapter 7 verses 13 to 14 Okay, so, so Jesus is saying, "I am that Son of Man." So he uses the term "Son of Man" with a very, very clear purpose in mind. He wants to tell these teachers of the law. you've been reading from the book of daniel right and you have read about the son of man well you know what i am that son of man and what does it say in daniel about the son of man it says that he has been given authority on the earth so jesus is saying if you remember your scriptures it says that the son of man has been given authority and that is what i am doing right now i'm exercising my authority to forgive the sins of this man so very very clear indication being given that jesus is telling them he is the divine person who has been given authority on earth you know and he goes on to say that his dominion is an everlasting dominion he says his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed so these are the things which it says about the son of man in daniel chapter 7 13 to 14 and here jesus is saying these are the things which it says in daniel 7 about the son of man and i will prove to you that i am that person and he actually heals that man he tells that man take up your mat and go 
and the man is able to actually do that so jesus declares who he is and he offers proof to the teachers of the law and saying see i am indeed the son of man i have been given the authority and let me demonstrate it and he demonstrates it and they realize that you know what he is speaking is the truth so those who are willing to believe they believe and then they, there are some who you know um don't want to know the truth and so they start arguing in their minds and coming up with all kinds of explanations not to accept the simple truth which they saw in front of their own eyes okay so we see um, all of that happening so even here there's a very clear declaration being made by Jesus saying that he is that son of man who was mentioned in Daniel chapter 7 and he has all the authority and he can in fact use the authority and demonstrate that he has authority to forgive sins he has authority to heal you know and that he indeed has dominion yeah so the question being asked over here is uh, on this occasion jesus gave proof that he is the son of man by doing a miracle and then there are some cases where the you know uh, especially the jewish leaders they come and they ask and they say give us a sign and then we will believe and jesus says no sign will be given to you the only sign you will have is the sign of jona you know who uh, who was in the uh, he was he was un what under the earth or something for 3 days and 3 nights and so jesus refuses to give them any sign so um and if you look if you look at the context of those particular passages where jesus says i will no longer give you any sign it's because he has already spent almost 3 years very very clearly demonstrating again and again in fact in john one of the chapters jesus says if you don't believe me at least believe the works which i do because the works are clearly showing who i am and so jesus gives enough opportunities he gives enough signs to prove that he is who is who he is claiming to be that he is indeed the son of god that he is indeed divine and when the people are still trying to look for explanations and excuses and not wanting to accept the truth which is very very plainly in front of them because then they would have to readjust their entire life and they are not willing to do that to such people jesus says i am not going to be giving you any other signs you already have enough indications you will just receive one more final sign where you will literally see me being resurrected from the dead now that if you if you're willing to believe that at least then yes you know there's hope for you even that if you're willing to reject then you know they are left to you know their own fate so it's a choice that people had to make and um, but jesus from his side gave enough demonstrations to show that he is indeed divine uh, just a minute Uh, yeah nina it's about the mic and the scriptures being read out they have one mic over here and they're all you know scurrying around trying to hand the mic to one another and it's very distracting for me uh, so um uh, it it kind of helps if you know they can or if, if if they have enough mics then you know they wouldn't have to keep running around to each other and i can see them doing that right so it's like a distraction for me um so um that is why i kind of told them to just stay in their places so that i can you know not get um distracted from what i am trying to you know from my flow of thought it's just because of that i uh, yeah uh, so sorry it's just that maybe if we can get enough mics one day then you know we can have them all uh, read out without having to like you know run from one to another handing over the mic just to have a verse read out uh, and it kind of affects the entire flow of the uh, talk Mm, yeah yeah what uh, yes so mm, yeah so these are the things which jesus said about himself about himself being divine uh, now what did the other people say the church leaders of that time the the you know the founders of the early church what did they say about uh, you know the divinity of jesus christ uh, we have uh, john you know who is like one of the main leaders of the of the early church um 
he was based in Ephesus. And then from there, he was, you know, kind of monitoring the activities of the church throughout, um, you know, Rome and throughout Asia Minor and all of that. And uh, so he was very well known, very well respected. Uh, and uh, that's probably why Jesus chooses him and says, you know, I want you to send a message to the seven churches, you know, in Revelation. So uh, John was one of the central, most important leaders of the early church. And what did John say about Jesus Christ? He very openly begins, you know, the gospel of John by declaring that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God himself. So John never had any doubt in his mind about the divinity of Jesus. Uh, another important leader uh, you know, of the early church, uh, that was Paul. Uh, so Paul, he says in Colossians 1, uh, um, verse 15. Yeah, if someone could read out Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Okay, it says that the sun is the image of the invisible God. So people cannot see the invisible God, but when they look at Jesus, he is the perfect image of the invisible God. So even though they cannot see God himself, they can see Jesus and know completely, fully what God is like, what his nature is. And the same thing is, uh, you know, something similar is said even in Colossians 1, 19. Uh, if someone can read out Colossians 1, verse 19. Yeah, it says here uh, that all his fullness, um, you know, the, all the enti entire fullness of God dwells in uh, Jesus Christ. So uh, Paul also was clearly indicating that um, uh, that that yeah that that Jesus is divine. Mm. We maybe we can uh, look at Philippians two verse six as well. If someone could read out Philippians chapter two verse six. Okay, um, Philippians two six. It says here that. Um, who being in very nature God. So Jesus in his nature was divine. Okay, he was completely divine, completely equal with the Godhead. Um, then coming to the writer of Hebrews, what does he say about uh, the divinity of Jesus? Mm, if we can look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. If someone could read out Hebrews 1, 3. It says here that this son, he is the exact representation of the being of God. Okay, so uh, again here, uh, this uh, an indication. So this wrong allegation that critics make that later on disciples came up with the idea that, oh, maybe we should start, you know, uh, saying that Jesus is divine. That is not true because in the very, very beginning itself, uh, even a few years after Jesus' death, while, you know, these um, gospels and epistles were being written out, already they were clearly declaring and saying that Jesus is God. It's not a theory that they came up with much later. And um, um, we also have, you know, ancient writings which confirm the fact uh, that uh, the that the Christian community believed and accepted Jesus as being divine. You know, Josephus, the first century historians, uh, he, he in, in both of his historical works, he makes mention of Jesus and he says uh, he talks about Jesus miracles. He talks about Jesus death and resurrection. So he, a historian makes a reference to Jesus as a historical fact. Uh, we also have someone named Tacitus, who was a Roman historian also from this first century itself. So when we're saying first century, we're talking about the first hundred years of you know the AD. So Jesus was approximately you know resurrected in around 
maybe 33 AD. So, which means within a matter of 60 to 70 years, these historians are making a historical record of the events surrounding Jesus' life. Okay, so um, we cannot say that these are things which people came up with later. You know, that would be a very, very wrong uh, argument to make. Uh, so Tacitus, a Roman historian also belonging to the first century, he says that these uh, Christians are worshipping Christus um, because he got resurrected. And they say that because of uh, this belief, a uh, huge number of followers are now following uh, Jesus. So he makes that record in his writing. We also have Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger was uh, the governor of Bithynia in Asia Minor. He writes a letter to Emperor Trojan. And he writes and says, these Christians are becoming quite a nuisance. Because of them, the Jews are getting very upset and there are riots going on everywhere. And he also says, because of these Christians, nobody is even going to the pagan temples. The pagan temples are all, almost becoming completely deserted. And then Trojan sends a letter back saying, all right, if this is the amount of effect these Christians are having, you are, you're welcome to, you know, you're free to persecute them. So uh, we have those uh, historical records also available with us today. Uh, we also have a person named Lucian, who was a Greek uh, writer. And uh, he writes very mockingly about Jesus. And uh, he says, oh, this Jesus uh, is supposed to have risen from the dead. And the Christians believe that. And so they believe that he will give them also it, you know, eternal life. And because of that, this, these Christians are not even afraid of death. Even, they are, even if they're being persecuted and being killed, they don't mind standing up for him because they really believe that, you know, um, they will be resurrected back to life one day. So um, these are all secular writers who didn't gain anything by talking about Jesus Christ, but they were all writing within, you know, that first few 70, 80 years of after Jesus' resurrection, they were writing and they were making a record of these facts so the doctrine of christ is not just something that you know we are you know drawing out of the bible there's even historical facts to to back up uh, that jesus really lived and that he really accomplished the things that he uh, did uh, just to you know quickly mention another two or three examples uh, you have emperor claudius uh, who was you know very very upset because of all the jewish riots that were going on and um, uh, so, in in fact, in 49 AD, he asks all the Jewish people to temporarily leave Rome and go because they are creating such a havoc over there. And so he actually asks them to leave the city and go. And he also issues an edict in Jerusalem and all the, you know, all the areas around that Israelite territory. He issues an edict saying, now onwards, nobody should even go near graves you know, near, near the tombs or meddle with them in any way. So why is he say, issuing an edict like that? That's because of what happened, you know, because of the events surrounding the death and resurrection of Jesus. So in fact, uh, one of those marble slabs with that edict on it have uh, were discover, was discovered in Nazareth, you know, where it clearly says, uh, if anyone tries to go to a grave or try to remove anything from the grave, they will be prosecuted. So... These are all historical realities backing up what the disciples have said about Jesus. And then, of course, you know, like I had mentioned earlier, uh, there were these two uh, writers, Thales and Phlegon, who talk about how there was an eclipse of the sun uh, when the resurrection was going on. So they say that uh, the, the, you know, the, the sky was darkened and uh, you know, there was an earthquake at that time. So Thales talks about the eclipse of the sun and Phlegon talks about uh, how at the sixth hour of the day, there was a great earthquake um, a, which shook Baithinya and which overturned Nicaea. Those are the wordings that he uses in his writing. So uh, we have historical facts backing up uh, what, um, you know, what Jesus Christ has accomplished. So when wrong teachings began to go around at that time in those early you know centuries uh, of the church about the divinity of jesus uh, again this too i have mentioned before the you know the christian leaders from the different churches came together 
and had a meeting at Nicaea. This was in 325 AD. By then, a lot of wrong teachings had come up about the divinity of Jesus. And so these, um, so the, so the main leaders, the main representatives from each of the churches which existed at that time, they all came together to discuss the serious matter where people are saying wrong things about Jesus Christ. They came together, they gathered in Nicaea in 325, and again later on in Constantinople in 381. And they came up with what we are, what we know today as the Nicene Creed. In the Nicene Creed, they laid down the actual correct doctrine as given by the uh, you know gospels and as written out in the epistles. So based on that, they came up with the doctrinal facts which we should accept as the truth. You know, in what they call the Nicene Creed. And over there it says, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. It refers to him as God of gods, light of light, very God of very God. And it also says, not made, being of one substance with the Father. So they declared that Jesus was not made. He was not created. He is one substance with the Father. These are the declarations which they wrote down in the Nicene Creed based on what the scripture is saying. So uh, one of the heresies that they were fighting against at that time uh, was this whole idea of, um, it, it's, it's called the heresy of adoptionism. What was the heresy of adoptionism? Uh, there was this belief, wrong belief. Again, I think I have mentioned this earlier. The wrong belief was that uh, they say that Jesus Christ was born to Joseph and Mary. He was just the biological child of both the parents. And he was a normal human being like everyone else. And then when one day when he was getting baptized, at that time, the spirit of the Messiah descended upon him and he became Messiah temporarily. So after uh, the Messiah who was inside this human, after he finished his work, uh, you know, on the cross, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, at that time, the spirit of the Messiah left him and went back to heaven. So temporarily, for a little while, Jesus Christ was divine, but he was not divine from birth. It's the, you know, it, it was the wrong um, doctrine that they were spreading. So the Nicene Creed, you know, kind of dealt with that. Another main uh, wrong heresy that the Nicene Creed was, wanted to attack was the wrong doctrine of the Arians. Um, Arius, the man named Arius and his followers, uh, you know, they were the ones who started this wrong teaching that Jesus was the, the, was the first creation that God created. After that, God created many other things. The first creation that God created was Jesus, was the wrong teaching, which they were spreading. And that is why in the Nicene Creed, they put in, a, they put in many, many sentences which were directly attacking this wrong doctrine. And uh, like, like I'd explained in the other class, uh, you know, the Jehovah Witnesses, they are a modern version of this uh, Arianism. So this is all about the divinity of Jesus Christ. Now, coming to the humanity of Jesus Christ, um, we have a whole bunch of scriptures which show us very, very clearly that Jesus Christ was human just like all of us. Uh, he, so not only was he fully God, he was also fully and completely human. Um, there are a whole bunch of verses. Some of them are mentioned in your notes. Some of them, I have them over here. Uh, you know, it would just take too much time to read all of that. I will just simply, you know, uh, point out the human factors, you know, uh, which which are very clear and which um, and which which scriptures, you know, talk about that particular human attribute of Jesus. So. Um, Luke 2 7 says that he was born. So, in the same way that we all are, you know, first conceived inside the womb and then we are physically born into the world, Jesus also was physically born, uh, just like all of us. And uh, just like the way all the human babies they develop physically and mentally over time, you know, Jesus Christ was also the same. The day that he came into the world, it's not like as if he already had full knowledge. And he was, and he was already, you know, uh, fully grown up. He too developed physically and mentally, just like all humans. Luke chapter two, verse fifty-two. 
He also knew hunger. He felt hungry just like all humans. Matthew 4.2. He felt thirsty. We see that in John 19.28. He experienced human emotions. John 11.35. You know, where he weeps. Um, he was limited in his knowledge the way human beings are limited. Uh, we see that in Mark chapter 13, verse 32. He grew tired, John 4, 6. Uh, he, just like the way all human beings die, Jesus Christ participated even in death, Matthew 27, 50. He was buried in a tomb in the way the people of those times were buried. Uh, you know, that's Matthew 27, verses 59 to 60. So he was fully human, just like all human beings. But, of course, he was also fully uh, divine. So, uh, the epi the, so those are all the scripture references which we find in the Gospels. What about the epistles? Even in the epistles, we find references to the humanity of Jesus. Um, so, um, um, 1 Peter 1, 16 to 18, uh, 1 John 1, 1, they talk in these two places, uh, we, the disciples talk about how they have seen him, how they have touched him, you know, how he was fully human with them, where they could actually reach out and touch him and talk to him. Um, 1 Timothy 3.16 talks about Jesus uh, appearing in the flesh, how he was there in a physical human body. Galatians 4.4 4 talks about how he was born of a woman. So he too you know, uh, went through those nine months in the womb and then he was born just like, you know, the rest of the human race. Um, of course, we have John 1.1, 1, 1, um, you know, uh, I mean, John 1.14, where, where John says that the word became flesh and lived for a while among us. Um, then um, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 to 3, uh, John says that, what is the you know what is the test to find out who is an actual true believer? Only the people who will acknowledge that Jesus came in the flesh, that he literally was you know living on the earth in a human body. Only such people are true believers. Those who believe in this fact, you know, uh, is what he says. So, um, which is why in the Nicene Creed, you know, it says over there, uh, he was made man. He was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. So it talks about his human aspects. And then the Nicene Creed goes on to talk about his divine aspects. He, it says he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, you know, and all of that. So the Nicene Creed tried to, you know, establish once for all that these are the doctrinal facts about Jesus. Okay, so um, after that, um, there was not that much confusion because now people knew, okay, this is what the church believes. This is what the elders of the church have gathered together and prayerfully discussed and they have determined that these are, this is what is written down in the scriptures. So it kind of helped them to have more clarity regarding this whole doctrine of uh, Christ. There was this one uh, set of heretics um, who they were known as the Docetists. The Docetists were people who were influenced by Greek thinkers. The Greek thinkers were of the belief that spirit is a good thing, but anything which is material is impure. So the so so the Christ followers who were influenced by Greek thinking began to think to themselves, how could Jesus become human? Because human means that he would have a material body and material is evil. And so they began to say, no, 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 he appeared human, but actually he was not human. He was only a spirit being because that somehow made them feel good about God. So now that, of course, is a heresy. So those were the docetists. They were a kind of Gnostics. The Gnostics was Gnostics, Gnosticism is a general term, but there were different varieties of Gnostics, and Docetists were one main, uh, you know, school of thought in this whole uh, heresy of Gnosticism. There was also this uh, people who were followers of, of Apollinarius, who said that Jesus, yes, definitely Jesus had a human body, but he didn't have a human soul. 
his soul was entirely divine what is the soul made up of mind will emotions so if um, jesus christ you know so according to this heresy jesus christ had a human body but he did not have a human mind he did not have a human soul so but when we look at jesus talking about himself he says that you know i do not know all the facts when he especially when he's talking about the end times you know and that would be in mark chapter 13 uh, verse 32 if we could have someone read out mark 13 32 but of the yeah, so Jesus says uh, very clearly, you know, about the end times when heaven and earth will pass away. Nobody knows exactly the day or the hour when this will happen. He says the angels in heaven don't know. And then he says, nor the son, even the son does not know. Only the father knows. So uh, while he was here on the earth, and he chose to be human. He chose also not to know everything because you know he was not using the uh, the divine nature which was in him. So he did have a human soul. His mind was human. So just like all the other human beings, he had to learn scripture. He had to study scripture. He had to memorize scripture. It's not that he just already had it all inside his mind. It's something that he actually had to learn. And uh, so, which is why when he's around 12 years old, we see him, you know, sitting over there in the temple and he is listening, he is learning and he's asking questions. So what you, you know, what you people are doing right now in the class, Jesus went through that phase where he sat, he listened, he memorized, he learned and he asked questions. Uh, if someone could read out Luke chapter 2 verse 46. Luke 2, 46. So he was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. So when it says here teachers, it's probably the scribes that it's talking about. At that time, I'm not sure whether he knew whether God had revealed to him the inside of these people's hearts. Knowledge-wise, they knew everything there was to know. But my goodness, it's very sad that their hearts were very, very far away from God. But anyway, they knew the scriptures inside out. So he was sitting over there in the temple courts, listening to them teach, learning from them, asking them questions. You know, So um, Jesus had a human soul. He had a human mind. It had to be taught. It had to be educated in the same way that, you know, we develop our minds and we develop our thinking. So it just so it's not, um, you know, these people seem to think Apollinarius and his followers seem to think that somehow if a person has, has a, a human soul, they cannot also be divine. But that doesn't apply to Jesus because Jesus had a human body. He had a human soul. And of course, he also was divine. You know, uh, the one thing doesn't take away the other thing. Uh, it's all, um, you know, it's all part of who he was. All right, we will, you know, look at other aspects of Jesus uh, when we come back from our break. So uh, at 10 o'clock, if we can all, you know, log back in. Thank you. Thank you. 